Hello, I'm Liz Hartnett from the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy, which is part of the iSchool here at the University of South Carolina. I'm happy to be speaking to you today about intellectual freedom and how it's reflected in library issues and practice. So to begin, think about what the term intellectual freedom means to you. Have your ideas about this evolved? And what has influenced you in formulating your ideas about intellectual freedom? Was it personal experience? Was it something you encountered in your studies and reading? And how important do you consider intellectual freedom in the field of library and information science? Let's take a brief look at some of the features of intellectual freedom, how they play out in society today, and the role that library and information science professionals can play. The ALA's basic definition of intellectual freedom describes what it is, and it also places on libraries the obligation to oppose the forces working against intellectual freedom. That's a pretty strong statement, and it puts intellectual freedom at the center of our work in libraries. Intellectual freedom protects the rights described in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. These rights include the free expression of all kinds, religion and the press, and it protects our right to explore ideas that interest us and to express our views even when they're unpopular. The American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights is all about protecting intellectual freedom. It describes principles relating to access and equity and the responsibilities of libraries as forums for information and ideas. This slide shows some of the important elements of intellectual freedom. One example is privacy. Privacy is very important. We all have the right to read and consider ideas free from observation or attention of others. Um, the ALA writes, true liberty of choice in the library requires both a varied selection of materials and the assurance that one's choices are not monitored. Other people don't need to know what a, someone is checking out at the library or what topics they're um, interested in pursuing. Uh, and that's why libraries do not release um, patron records uh, to anyone who asks for them. Um, speaking about uh, the varied selection of materials being important, that um, um, takes us around to access, which is related. When we talk about access, we mean making available books and other print materials, certainly, but there are um, more ways that libraries uh, ensure access. Libraries produce, provide many users with free internet access and subscription databases, and also programming um, that meets their needs and interests. Access can be physical or virtual. And what's required for that access can differ depending on the person you're serving. So for example, some people do not own a device and would not have access to digital um, resources. So the library has to find a way to um, serve those patrons as much as they possibly can. There's an array of factors that may restrict access to library information and services. The library's location, for example, is it a rural or urban library? And is there public transportation available so people can get to the library? The physical facility has an impact on access. How is it designed? Is it um, accessible to people with disabilities, for example? Um, the policies that a library has in place <coughs> can also Im influence access. Um, do, does the library charge fees or enact other policies that might exclude low-income people, for example? Intellectual freedom is severely hampered when people have limited access to the information they need, and our level of access is often influenced by social factors such as income, geographic location, age, ability level, education, etc. Related to access are issues like copyright and intellectual property, and they sort of um, are, uh, there's some tension between those ideas and access, because 
um, intellectual freedom protects the right to access information, but it also protects the creators of information from having their work used without permission. So ideas like fair use and fair compensation for authors, artists, musicians have to be balanced against providing as much access to ideas and information as we possibly can without infringing on the rights of the um, people who create that information. Probably the most talked about aspect of intellectual freedom is censorship. That's the suppression of ideas and it runs counter to our professional values. Censorship takes many forms and can be found in the news every day. You can probably think of a situation you've heard of recently that has to do with intellectual freedom. Um, and it's interesting to think about these it's, and consider them um, and look at how they fit into your ideas about intellectual freedom or, or do not <laughs> fit. Um, one example I can recall from re in recent years was uh, when the publishers of Dr. Seuss's books who own the rights to those books decided to discontinue publishing new editions of um, several of his his books, um, not not his best known books, some fairly obscure titles that um, contained some problematic or offensive depictions of black and Asian people. And um, if you you may recall hearing about that and that there was a, quite an outcry uh, about, um, you know, accusing the publishers of censorship. And um, it, it did generate some useful conversations, I think, around um, is that censorship um, when a p private company decides that they're not going to sell a product anymore, they're not going to produce a product anymore, um, or, or is that a business decision? So um, another topic related to um, intellectual freedom and censorship that's been in the news a lot lately is academic freedom related to you know, um, intellectual property and academic freedom, the freedom to explore and learn and teach and share knowledge. Um, there has been a lot of contentious debate about, uh, for example, what should and shouldn't be taught in American history classes in public schools. And there's been uh, actually, you know, laws have been passed and legislators are dis discussing you know, limiting, restricting what teachers can include in their instruction on history uh, to avoid sort of what they see as divisive topics like, you know, explaining uh, racism and how it um, influenced the development of the country and, uh, you know, the, uh, the aftermath of the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, all, all those types of things. So um, these are important discussions um, and, and things that we need to keep uh, abreast of as library professionals. Ideas don't have to be in print to be censored. Speech itself can also be censored. Um, and one example of that recently was when um, a high school girl had tried out for the cheerleading squad and didn't, didn't make the squad and she was very upset and vented her frustration on social media and was suspended for doing so. This situation led to a larger discussion of how far the authority and control of the school extends in a digital world. Are students under the school's authority 24-7 on any digital platform, even when they're nowhere near the school building? These are um, important questions and they're, they're nothing new. Um, it calls to mind the um, 1965 case that's um, detailed on this slide where um, the, the students freedom to protest uh, the Vietnam War was um, being restricted by the school um, and they took they took the school to court and they won and the court's um, decision uh, included the statement that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. So schools are in a unique um, position I think in that they have to protect students and provide age-appropriate instruction and materials but they also have to guard their um, 
First Amendment rights. Oh, um, like many important questions, these um, and ideas that are related to intellectual freedom, the answers to these questions can be very foggy. One important consideration about speech in particular is the effect it can have that you can reasonably expect it to have on others. Hate speech, for example, goes beyond the intent of free expression. What constitutes hate speech, though, and who decides? These are, um, an, there's another kind of foggy question. Um, if you're interested in the idea of hate speech um, in the resources at the end of this presentation, there's linked to a seven minute video that discusses hate speech on college campuses, which has become quite an issue in recent years. So that's a very um, interesting piece that I would recommend. One example of how libraries protect free expression of ideas in a non-print format is providing programming and displays for people with a variety of interests and space. Um, a variety of interests and then also providing space for community groups to meet. So they have the meeting rooms that people can use and um, it's important that uh, the library provide equitable access to those facilities too. Um, that, that can be challenging and there's a tricky balance between making facilities available as this um, Bill of Rights article says, regardless of the beliefs or affiliations of individuals or groups requesting their use, whether the library agrees with what these groups stand for or not, um, should not enter into the decision to let um, people use their meeting rooms. Um, but on the other hand, down below, it, it um, acknowledges that um, some of these activities or just having the people present in the public space can um, cause fear or discomfort for some people in certain situations. So this is why the library has to um, has to have user behavior policies that will protect um, other library users and the staff from this t sort of harm um, that may occur uh, in certain situations when groups are using the public space. It's essential, always essential for a library to have a well thought, thought out policy in place regarding the use of meeting spaces, as well as the considerations taken in choosing the exhibits to feature in the library. That way, if and when questions arise, the library's reaction is measured and consistent with the library's mission. So very important. Um, idea that to keep in mind that policies may not be exciting but they are really vital to protecting um, intellectual freedom. We often think of book challenges when we hear the word censorship and this is an important topic in our field. The ALA provides support for libraries going through a materials challenge so if there is a challenge in your library it should be reported to the ALA. They keep track of challenges and they also offer, as I said, a lot of support to librarians who are dealing with the challenge. Um, they also offer um, tips on writing a good policy so you're prepared for these challenges. And um, their support and policy toolkit is also linked in resources at the end of this presentation. These are some of the reasons that are most often um, given for objecting to a book in a library's collection and um, especially in uh, books for children, uh, there's all there's often a question of this this is not appropriate for their the age it's not age appropriate and that's a very difficult thing another really difficult thing to pin down um, you know what's appropriate for one eight year old might not be appropriate for another eight year old some kids are very advanced readers or have you know different they all have different life experiences. Um, and backgrounds and uh, family situations, so uh, it's very difficult to say that a specific book is absolutely not appropriate for any child. Of course, librarians um, make careful selection choices, especially um, in schools where their their patrons are divided up by age, right? So you have your elementary school library. That those uh, collection decisions look a lot different than decisions made by a high school librarian. 
So ALA does keep track of challenges, as I said, and here are the um, top 10 most challenged books for 2020. And when we look at the, the lists, we can, it's interesting to see what topics are being targeted most often and um, see these kind of reflected in, cert, in current social conditions. So, uh, for example, several of the challenge books for that year were related to anti-racism. And it's interesting to consider how that lines up with the current uproar over critical race theory, as well as, you know, the fact that in 2020 is when the Black Lives Matter movement really took off um, and there was a lot of uh, civil unrest related to um, racial justice. Um, in 2019, most um, eight out of 10 of the most challenged books had LGBTQIA themes and characters. And this trend continues with books relating to gender and sexuality coming under fierce scrutiny from some school districts and state legislators around the country currently. Another interesting aspect of censorship is what we call self-censorship, and it's something that's practiced by librarians who are making um, selections for their, for their library collection. Um, this is where um, a librarian is aware that a book is controversial and decides, makes a decision, sometimes subconsciously, but decides not to purchase that book in order to avoid the potential uh, you know, um, I guess, uh, conflict that might arise if the book is in the library collection. Um, and, it's, and it's easy to rationalize that decision. You can say, um, you know, the library only has so much money to spend on books and I'm going to, you know, buy, there's lots of really good books to buy that would not be controversial. So um, that's easier. Um, also, some, some librarians face a lot of pushback from administration. Um, or um, in the public libraries, I guess, uh, board members or um, public figures. So um, they, they prefer to fly under the radar. And that is, um, is a problem that I think is, I, I don't think we've studied that, but I think it's increasing um, with all of the recent book challenges that have been coming along, especially in school libraries. Um, so the book on this slide is uh, the winner of the Caldecott for 2020 for illustration and it's about the um, protest in 2016 by the Standing Rock Sioux tribe um, over the uh, construction of the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline which was went right across their land and um, was went under a lake that was their only source of water. So they were protesting that. It was a months long, uh, drawn out protest. The, um, and so this book is about that. Uh, and there's a discussion linked in our resources that of where school librarians, some, some school librarians were worried about including this in their collection or at least promoting it to kids. Um, and, and there were, you know, two sides to the two views. Um, primarily that this is uh, this topic is too political for kids and others people um, would point to themes of community unity and cooperation and nonviolent change um, in the book which they consider you know beneficial so as I said there's an article linked in our resources about that if you want to learn more about that situation And then, um, so when we're talking about, uh, as I mentioned, policies are super important, even though they're not um, uh, very interesting sometimes. Uh, so selection and reconsideration policies are our are, are primary tools for dealing with book challenges in the library. Um, collection development decisions should always be based on established policy. And those policies will outline how the materials are chosen for the library and they'll state the importance of access in the library. So they should include um, the, the library's position on access. Reconsideration policies will clearly lay out how materials challenges will be handled in the library. And that is, as I said, 
you know, really essential for effectively dealing with book challenges in a consistent way, a fair way that um, considers everybody's, all, everyone involved. So another, another aspect of policy and procedures that is really critical to equitable service and can have a profound impact on the intellectual freedom of the people we serve is cataloging, which you wouldn't think maybe that that has such an impact. But um, so many libraries depend on the Library of Congress's list of subject headings for their catalog entries. And there are thousands of Library of Congress subject headings. It's a tremendously long list. If you ever take a look at their website, you can see how many there are. And there are, and there are hundreds and hundreds being added every year. So it's not easy to maintain that list and keep it current. Um, there's been a good bit of discussion about the damage done when outdated and biased subject headings are used. They can serve to further marginalize groups that may already be underserved. And on this slide, um, there are links to, and in the resources, links to a great article called The Bias Hiding in Your Library that talks about um, biased subject headings and some examples are um, provided here on the slide. And then the other resource that I would encourage you to look at is a documentary called Change the Subject, where a group of students um, worked with the Library of Congress to revamp some harmful, um, biased um, headings and uh, ran into uh, pushback from the United States Congress. So it's a very, very interesting story and a true story. Um, so, and, and well done documentary, so I recommend that. So, how libraries operate, what procedures they use for everything from cataloging to programming to selecting materials for the collection has an impact on the public's intellectual freedom. Having effective policies in place is essential for protecting the rights of patrons. I hope you'll remember that ALA tells us libraries have an obligation to oppose the forces working against intellectual freedom and consider the rights of library users in all aspects of your work. Thank you for your interest in intellectual freedom and please do contact us or see the linked resources for further information.